didn't happen is often much more important than what did happen. And the way they teach history is fallacious. It, it's really based on the idea that you record what happened. You say what happened, then you add your spin to it. You give your color. But the more value is when you ask, well, what didn't happen? What should have happened, for good or for bad, but what but didn't occur? And then when you start with that, you can then start seeing a drama form. You start seeing people, individual personalities, play come to the stage of history that you didn't think were meaningful, that you thought were maybe irrelevant. This question of what didn't happen is important because it's all about the future. I mean, history is really about knowing that our future, because we're living in history, and someday historians are going to look at our us and our time frame and think who acted and who didn't act according to what was necessary, right? And, and we're living in that history. Um, so we, we are, and so history is all based on the future. People at different times had concepts of the future that they thought understood was necessary, and they fought for their idea of where the future should be. Um, and some of those ideas were in alignment with natural law and human nature, and some of those ideas were totally in opposition, based on like what Christine went through with uh, the master-slave system of, that Lincoln despised. Right? Some people will die to defend the master-slave system, and did die. That was what the Civil, Ro Civil War was all about. Um, and that last quote again by Lincoln that, dealt, that, that had, in Lincoln's mind, it's so clear that he understood that the slave system and the system of hereditary institutions of divine rights of kings, of empire, were the same thing, right? The Confederate slave system was a microcosm of the global empire system of your, your destiny is tied to what your, your, your dad did, what his dad did, what, so your genes and your family, your blood, defines who you are and what you can do. Right. That's bullshit. Right. And people like Lincoln, like these great Americans, like Cassius Clay, understood that. People like Tsar Nicholas the, Alexander II, who abolished the surf system, had a very clear concept of that. Uh, so did Gilpin. Um, but unfortunately, as, as Cynthia pointed out, the, the wave of assassinations at the end of the 19th century, uh, as well as the color revolutions that struck Russia, artificial revolutions that turned them upside down, um, and killed the Romanov family. Uh, but then also set into motion the process that we call today World War I, World War II. All of these were artificial arsonists putting a fire on a beautiful structure that was being built that they, they knew that if it was permitted, it would, their power, this British imperial power of hereditary institutions would be gone forever. So, history in that sense is a bit of a tragedy. I'm going to take a, a second part of this. I have a picture on the... Uh, the projector here of, of two people, one person I guarantee you, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows, the second person you may or may not know, um, everybody knows Franklin Roosevelt, right? Anybody know the guy beside Roosevelt is? No. <laughs> huh? Wallace. The guy, yeah, I got a wall. All right, I got a Henry Wallace. Vice President, um, best, I mean, one of Roosevelt's most trusted allies. He was Vice President until 1945, January. And uh, formerly he was the agricultural secretary. Um, Wallace and Roosevelt really shared a common passion for reviving the. And that's, you. I found. that's good to know. For reviving the Alexander Lincoln dream of a multipolar alliance for the world. And it took, after these assassinations, uh, a good 30 years. After, after McKinley was assassinated, there really wasn't a. An honorable president, except for one effort by uh, Harding, who also died after two years in office uh, under very mysterious circumstances in 1924. Uh, there was that was really the only one attempt to revive this, this constitutional America until Roosevelt came about in 1933. Both he and Wallace shared a vision for the, for the world. I'm going to play a little clip uh, of a speech that, that Wallace gave um, that was televised in 1942. In showcasing this multipolar vision for a post for the for the world. This is that right after America had joined the war. This is a fight between a slave world and a free world. Just as the United States in 1862 could not remain half slave and half free, so in 1942 the world must make its decision for a complete victory one way or the other. Down the years, the people of the United States have moved steadily forward in the practice of democracy. When the freedom-loving people march, when the farmers have an opportunity to buy land at reasonable prices and to sell the produce of their land through their own organizations, 
When the workers have the opportunity to form unions and bargain through them collectively, and when the children of all the people, these opportunities are open to everyone, then the world moves straight ahead. But the march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long drawn out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people, there were the American Revolution of 1775, the French Revolution of 1792, the Latin American revolutions of the Bolivarian era, the German Revolution of 1848, the Russian Revolution of 1918. Each spoke for the common man in terms of blood on the battlefield. Some went to excess, but the significant thing is that the people groped their way to the light. The people are on the march toward even fuller freedom than the most fortunate peoples of the earth have hitherto enjoyed. The people, in their millennial and revolutionary march toward manifesting here on earth the dignity that is in every human soul, hold as their credo the four freedoms enunciated by President Roosevelt. We who live in the United States may think there is nothing very revolutionary about freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom from the fear of secret police. But when we begin to think about the significance of freedom from want for the average man, then we know that the revolution of the past 150 years has not been completed, either here in the United States or in any other nation in the world. We know that this revolution cannot stop until freedom from want has been attained. Yeah, and so the, the way uh, Cynthia ended her class with the Lincoln Monuments and that, that <coughs> intention uh, to ensure, like, as Lincoln understood that the nation couldn't be both half slave and half free, Wallace here, along with Roosevelt, are saying 80 years later that the world can't be both half slave and half free. So they're, they're basically, they recognize that the fight of World War II is about more than simply defeating Mussolini and Hitler, yeah. but rather liberating all of mankind from empire, from divine rights of king systems. I want people to get to know some of these individuals of history, okay? So I'm going to read some quotes, uh, only because I find it's by reading a quote that you come to really know somebody and what their intention is. Um, when Roosevelt came to the stage of World War II, <clears throat> we see often these, these various um, pictures of him, of Stalin, of Churchill together throughout the course of World War II. I happen to really like this particular picture of, uh, of the three of them because that look on, Stal on Winston Churchill's face is just extraordinary and I think it says so much. Um, you'll always find when the, within these pictures that Roosevelt is sitting between Churchill and Stalin. You'll never have Stalin sitting beside Churchill. Stalin's trust in Roosevelt was, was very high. He recognized that, that Churchill was a traitor who would be happy to destroy everything that Russia stood for and destroy the world. Um, Stalin had his own enemies and he had his own problems, and I'm not here to defend Stalin. He shouldn't be defended on everything that he did. However, he wasn't an imperialist communist. Stalin had the view, unlike Trotsky, that Russia should try to be the best socialist communist sort of state. And that in, and in doing so, and uplifting the quality of life of their people, that the world would want to emulate uh, that example. Kind of like the same philosophy of the better parts of Americans who thought of themselves as the city on the hill. They're not there to enforce their system on the world, but by being an example to, to emulate the world would follow suit in Republican principles. Very different from the imperial Russian or imperial and American approaches to subduing the weak and pushing your system onto them. Very different. Um, both Roosevelt and Stalin shared a similar view of where the world should go or could go after uh, the Hitler machine was beaten. 
the one thing I want to say about um, Roosevelt, this is, how, this is a picture taken in 1943, 10 years before this picture. Yeah, Stalin, Roosevelt, Middle, Churchill, they're looking grim, sort of seeing that the thing that, that he stands for is uh, drifting away. Yeah, so he sees that there's a potential lot of destruction of the British Empire. Um, ten years before this picture was taken, Roosevelt was elected in 1932. He was inaugurated in 1933. And immediately upon being inaugurated, he made the point in several speeches that Lincoln, who was a Republican, makes the point that Lincoln, that the Republican Party has become so corrupt as a party of Wall Street that they've lost the right to claim Lincoln as their own and that Lincoln should be taken up as a Democrat by the Democrats, which, which Roosevelt was a member, right? He was a, the leader of the Democratic Party. And again, that's, that's why the idea of party politics is so stupid. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's about the system that you're operating in that's so much more important. And mm -hmm. though, though Roosevelt and Lincoln were two different parties, they represented the same thing and they died for the same thing. Um, <clears throat> when he came in, there was four years of Great Depression, so the, the financial system had been artificially blown out in 1929. It was, an, it was a bubble that was created in the 20s, in the roaring 20s of unbounded speculation, easy money. And at a certain point, the brokers on Wall Street, people like uh, Brown Brothers, Harriman Banking Family, uh, J.P. Morgan Trusts, coordinated a simultaneous broker call loan that would, that would be called in so that all the brokers who were gambling with money that they didn't have would all be told the same day that they had to give in the loan that they had all taken out by these banking houses, which they couldn't pay. It was all tied up in speculation. And the default on those loans, on those broker call loans, initiated as it was understood to, to initiate, uh, that was the pinprick that blew out the chain reaction defaults that, under, that took down the world system. It started in America in Black Tuesday, but it spread internationally across Europe, Canada, and elsewhere into five, four years of Great Depression. It was really more than that. Um, there was no solution, and, and the only solutions being proposed were solutions like, you know, Hitler, uh, Mussolini's corporate fascism is your economic miracle solution, which is what Americans and Canadians were being told to do to solve their problems, to put bread on their table after uh, the Great Depression. That, you know, fascism was going to, again, put you to work, build trains, build roads. Mussolini was on the cover of Time magazine. Six times by 1933, Mussolini was on the cover of Time magazine, that's right. Um, Hitler was twice. Hitler was twice, and then he was man of the year by 37, uh, 38. Um, so, the only non-fascist, really, in America that, that had a chance, and that really took that chance, was Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. And he, through a, an incredible series of maneuvers that's outlined in a, in a documentary uh, produced by LPAC uh, some years ago, ended up actually becoming, much in many ways, like, like Lincoln in his time um, was the dark horse candidate nobody thought could win, but ended up becoming the person who became the Democratic nominee and, and won the presidency because he had a policy, he had a program, nobody else did. That was, complete, that was based on just rejecting the political economic system of the Great Depression and putting people to work. But more than that, he, he earned people's trust by putting hundreds of bankers in prison. So immediately he had his 100 days after getting elected where he put in Glass-Steagall, he broke up the banks that did the Great Depression. He, he said, you can't be a speculator and a commercial bank at the same time. He broke them up, cleansed the system of the unpayable debts. He had the Cora Commission, a Ferdinand Cora to bring J.P. Morgan Jr. onto into trial in front of cameras and prove how they orchestrated the Great Depression. He, um, he was able to create the SEC for the first time to regulate the banking system. He was able to take control of the Federal Reserve by putting his own man in there, uh, Mariner Eccles. And he used the Federal Reserve, much like a national bank, to issue government bonds and credit for infrastructure projects. That had never happened. The Federal Reserve was always a private central bank, never used. It was never, ever permitted that a government official should be able to utilize it for development until Roosevelt did what he did. And he also to torpedoed a, the London Conference. A lot of people don't know, but there was a program for a banker's dictatorship in 1933 by the City of London and the League of Nations. And that was called the London Conference. And it was supposed to create a one-world currency and a one-world banker's dictatorship to get rid of nation-states that Roosevelt single-handedly torpedoed and undermined. He sabotaged the whole thing um, and basically told them to go, you know, and take a hike. So... <clears throat> the London Conference of 
So, and that was, you know, there's a whole story there. So there's a lot that Roosevelt did, and over the course of the 30s, in, in building these big projects like the Four Corners Projects, the uh, Hoover Dam, the Tennessee Valley Authority to electrify the South, um, he built, in the first several months, he was able to put 11 million Americans to work. Um, he was able to create hundreds of new schools, libraries, colleges. He had spent, he put government funds like we've never seen towards the arts. And so it was a multi-level um, solution that we call the New Deal today, and it was sabotaged the entire time the 1930s unfolded. You had Wall Street bankers contracting the money supply, buying up government bonds so that the government couldn't access those bonds needed to then generate the credit needed to invest in the project. So Wall Street was playing these dirty games the whole time. Um, big part of the reason why, why Roosevelt banned gold is tied to these manipulations on the markets, uh, the price of gold manipulations. That was the reason why. There was something to it. That was, that was also the reason why the city of London banks all wanted a global gold standard uh, to be the one world base, the basis of the one world currency. So whenever you encounter people, and I often, you know, we often do, who just are fixated religiously on gold, uh, they were missing something higher. So all that to say, by getting America, bringing America into a situation where they were able to become productive, he was able to rebuild the industry. 70% of America's uh, manufacturing center had gone, was shut down in the four years of the Great Depression. He was able to revive that. And by creating that basis over 10 years, America was able to finally enter World War II and stop the Hitler machine, which was a Wall Street, City of London funded machine. Right? As, as has been proven time and again, had it not been for Prescott Bush and the different City of London uh, financiers and Wall Street financiers, who today run much of our world, Hitler and Mussolini could not have existed. And they wanted America to be a fascist America. So Roosevelt did a lot. I'm, I'm skipping a lot here, okay? But just to say, he did a lot. And um, a lot of people today, I, I, I've noticed, tend to think that Roosevelt wanted simply to replace the British Empire and create a, an American Empire. That's common theor uh, theory we're all given. It's a common opinion. It's very popular. Um, it's not true. And it took me a long time to figure this out. I think we've all sort of been through our own experience of, of discovery to recognize that there's been a bit of a, uh, a sleight of hand. Roosevelt not only didn't want an American empire, he did have a conscious idea, just like Lincoln and, and Gilpin did, to destroy the British Empire. He actually wanted to destroy it after the World War II would be finished. And I'm going to read a series of quotes by Roosevelt that were published from a book written by his son, Elliot, in a book called As He Saw It in 1946, after Roosevelt died, um, to give people a sense of what Roosevelt envisioned for the post-war world and why it didn't come to pass, but what those battles were. And he recorded the battles between Roosevelt and Churchill really well. But before I get to the Churchill-Roosevelt battle, the first thing that Eliot records is Roosevelt's vision for where the world should be. And I like this. Um, but his, Eliot records his father saying, I'm talking about another war, Eliot. I'm talking about what will happen to our world if after this war we allow millions of people to slide back into the, self, the same semi-slavery. Don't think for a moment, Eliot, that Americans would be dying in the Pacific tonight if it hadn't been for the short-sighted greed of the Russian, the French, and the British, and the Dutch. Shall we allow them to do it all, all over again? Your son will be about the right age, 15 or 20 years from now. One sentence, Elliot, then I'm going to kick you out of here. I'm tired. <laughs> he was, it was very late and I had a long day. I just wanted to go to bed. He's very exact. Yeah. <laughs> this is the sentence. When we've won the war, I will work with all my might and main to see that the United States is not wheedled into the position of accepting any plan that will further France's imperialistic ambitions, or that will aid or abet the British Empire in its imperialistic ambitions. So the, the next day, this is during the, uh, the Casablanca conference uh, where you had the major heads of state meeting. Um, in 1943 to discuss again the terms of the war, but also the post-war terms as well. Now, the next day, he meets with Churchill and a, a coterie of British and American representatives, and they have a fight. 
and this fight, as far as I know, has only been recorded, or at least most clearly recorded, by Elliot in this book. And I think for that reason, I've, I've got three slides. After the war, one of the preconditions of any lasting peace will have to be the greatest possible freedom of trade. He paused. The PM's head was lowered. He was watching fathers steadily from under one eyebrow. No artificial barriers. As few favored economic agreements as possible. Opportunities for expansion. Markets open for healthy competition. His eye wandered in necessity around the room. Churchill shifted in his armchair. <laughs> the British Empire trade agreements are... Father broke in. Yes, those empire trade agreements are a case in point. It's because of them that the people of India and Africa, of all the colonial Near East and Far East, are still as backward as they are. Churchill's neck reddened and he crouched forward. Mr. President, England does not propose for a moment to lose its favoured position among the British dominions. The trade that has made England great shall continue, and under conditions prescribed by England's ministers. You see, said Father slowly, <laughs> it is along in here somewhere that there is likely to be some disagreement between you Winston and me. I am firmly of the belief that if we are to arrive at a stable peace, it must involve the development of backward countries, backward peoples. How can this be done? It can't be done, obviously, by 18th century methods. Now... Who's talking about 18th century methods? Whichever of your ministers recommends a policy which takes wealth in raw materials out of a colonial country, but which returns nothing to the people of that country in consideration. 20th century methods involve bringing industry to these colonies. 20th century methods include increasing the wealth of a people by increasing their standard of living, by educating them, by bringing them sanitation, by making sure that they get a return for the raw wealth of their community. Around the room, all of us were leaning forward, attentively. Hopkins was grinning. Commander Thompson, Churchill's aside, was looking glum and alarmed. The PM himself was beginning to look up a what? Who mentioned what? India? Yes, I can't believe that we can fight a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from a backward colonial policy. What about the Philippines? I'm glad you mentioned them. They get their independence, you know, in 1946, and they've gotten modern sanitation, modern education, their rate of illiteracy has gone steadily down. There can be no tampering with the empire's economic agreements. They are artificial. They are the foundation of our greatness. The peace, said Father, Father Family, <laughs> cannot include any continued despotism. The structure of the peace demands and will get equally of peoples. Equality of peoples, sorry. Equality of peoples involves the utmost freedom of competitive trade. Will anyone suggest that Germany's attempt to dominate trade in Central Europe was not a major contributing factor to war? Okay, so wait, so that was it. That's all I recorded. The, the, the discussion goes on, and you can get the whole book online on archive.org. But I thought that that just indicated a little for bit free. nicely for free. For free. Um, now the conversation sort of ended that evening. That was the substance of it. Um, but it, it continued again the next morning, and that's where we kick in now to the the narrative. So you can go now. Okay. The following day, Elliot <laughs> describes how the conversation continued between the two men, with Churchill's uh, stating, "Mr. President." I believe you are trying to do away with the British Empire 
Every idea you entertain about the structure of the post-war world de demonstrates it. But in spite of that... And it's in, four, uh, mm, and it's four finger away. In spite of that, yeah. we know that you constitute our only hope. And... You know, <laughs> you know that we know it. You know that we know it. You know that we know that without America, the Empire won't stand. Churchill admitted, in that moment, that he knew that peace could only be won according to the precepts which the United States of America would lay down. And in saying that he did, he was acknowledging the British colonial policy would be a dead duck and the British attempts to dominate the world trade would be a dead duck mm -hmm. and the British ambitions to play off the USSR against the USA would also be a dead duck <laughs> or would have been if father had lived. Yeah, I think that that's great. And his, his son is just so aware of how this yeah. game was being played and who was going to be in the driver's yes. seat shaping the conditions <laughs> of the post-war world. Uh, it wasn't just FDR and, and Wallace, though. As we see, I mean, when you really look into, again, some of these unsung heroes I was talking about, uh, there's people like Harry Hopkins, who's there on the top left with Stalin. There's people like uh, Sumner Wells, on um, the top right was the Assistant Secretary of State, also a devout anti-imperialist. Uh, from 1937 to 43, he was the Assistant Secretary of State, and he fought valiantly along with Roosevelt to ensure that the New Deal would go global. Um, he was a, 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 a great, great grandson of Charles Sumner, who we met in Cynthia's program, and he took great pride in his connection to Charles Sumner, who fought to have the Bering Strait Tunnel uh, finalized. Um, he was, he was a, there, there was a whole scandal that caused him to lose his job in 43. Um, there you have Wendell Wilkie with Stalin as well, who was the, uh, known as the Republic, he was the head of the Republican Party, and he was Roosevelt's man, Republican, he was called Republican New Dealer, who Roosevelt uh, recruited as the New Deal ambassador to the world and sent him on two worldwide uh, trips from 1942 and again in 44. As a Republican. As a Republican. Yeah. Mm. Uh, to yeah, spread the view of internationalizing the American system of mutual development of all nations together, utilizing their right to protective tariffs, breaking free of the empire's trade agreements uh, around the world that allowed nations to be cash cropping uh, nations that would just be. Uh, yeah. So. His <clears throat> name again is what they are asking. Oh, his name? His name is Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie. Yeah, that's, and that's Wendell Wilkie there shaking hands with uh, Chiang Kai-shek at the time, who was the, uh, the, the person who was most friendly to America. Yeah, the, the guy at the bottom right is a uh, guy named uh, Harry Dexter White, who was the first director of the IMF and founder of the IMF. He was a major ally of Roosevelt, who also met a very untimely end. Uh, this is part of the thing, right, where when you look at the history that didn't happen but should have happened again, you start seeing that institutions like the IMF, the, the, the International Monetary Fund, that have played a very negative role in world history as an imperial banking enforcer, uh, keeping nations locked into conditionalities and, and, and usury, usury is debt, uh, actually had legitimate foundations. And when Roosevelt and, and uh, Dexter White originally created the Bretton Woods framework for the post-war world, it was designed with the World Bank and the IMF to be lenders, to be instruments to provide long-term credit to Africa, to India, to other countries, for their development needs so that they can stand on their own two feet. In many ways similar to what, Ch what China is doing today under the Belt and Road Initiative with the China Import-Export Bank providing credit for Africa uh, infrastructure and, and more. So there's, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more in depth. But he, yeah, and he was a major opponent of uh, John Maynard Keynes, who people are told today Roosevelt inspired Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was a Keynesian, New Deal was Keynes, that's not true. Uh, he was an enemy of Keynes. Keynes hated Roosevelt. Keynes called Roosevelt an economic incompetent. Um, Roosevelt thought he was just a, an ivory tower mathematician and wrote... Uh, Tell the story of Newton. No. <clears throat> okay, yeah, you know what, I will. Anybody know the story of Keynes and Newton? Newton? No. He loved Keynes and Newton? Isaac Newton. Yeah, I know, they're, they're, they lived in different time frames. Yeah. But 
Keynes, uh, being a, a devout Fabian Society mathematician, he uh, saves up his money so that he could purchase on an auction the chess that they had discovered of Isaac Newton's writings in Cambridge's oh, one of the basements. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. And finally he won the bid and he made a bid. He was so excited that finally for the first time in 350 years we were going to see how, how Newton made his discoveries, which were never known. You know, because, whatever. Apple still on his head. Because his dog burnt down his house. Right, his dog, that was the official story. The dog burnt down his no, lab in his house and, and destroyed the records. No, I put dog burnt my house down. So finally we were going to see how he discovered what his notes were, what his science was, <laughs> behind the calculus. Um, and so he, I never thought of that one. What was that? Dog burnt down my house. Oh yeah, that was, that was yeah. Really? Yeah, that's smart. Uh, probably the smartest thing he ever came up with. Was that excuse? <laughs> And, and so, you know, we began uh, Cynthia's class with, with Leibniz and Leibniz's discovery of the calculus. It, you know, we, we're told that Leibniz and Newton discovered the calculus at the same time, or that Newton discovered it and Leibniz ripped it off. None of that's true. Leibniz discovered the calculus, Newton ripped it off. Newton um, said that dog bird died house fish, they're crazy. Uh, and then finally, when they, when they found this record, when they... No, exactly. So finally, when this chest of papers was discovered in Cambridge, where we, everyone thought that now they were going to finally know how it came about the calculus. What were the, what were the tests you did to, to go along that journey? And he called the press of all around the world to finally come to the grand opening. And when they opened the chest, Keynes was super embarrassed because all that was in there was tens of thousands of pages of black magic alchemy. No science. Just basically showcasing that Newton was a synthetic, a synthetic shell of a person created by other people. Uh, to basically take over real discoveries that were made by real people, like like Kepler and like Leibniz. Is that, how is that documented, that particular thing? Is that... that yeah, there's a lot of documentation on that. That's, a, that's not a conspiracy theory. It's that's not fact. talked about, that's for sure. People, like, like, people, people try to like run away from that fact. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Hey, you got to get Newton in some period, right? He probably looked at his star sign. It's like, okay, I can ripple flatness today. You know, like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. ripple. Yeah, probably took the right time of year to do yeah. it. Um, so all that to say, okay, there's a whole array of international New Dealers, people who are like like Charles Sumner and Seward, who are following the Lincoln design for the post war post Civil War vision. These guys are doing the same thing, wanting to liberate the, the world from empire. Wendell Wilkie, I was just going through uh, some papers and found a great quote by Wilkie in 1942 after he returned from being Stalin. He had traveled to all of these different African countries to plan and coordinate the, uh, the industrialization of these countries after the war. And he wrote, in Africa, the Middle East, throughout the Arab world, as well as in China, and the whole Far East, freedom means the orderly but scheduled abolition of the colonial system. When I say that in order to have peace, this world must be free, I am only reporting that a great process has started which no man, certainly not Hitler, can stop. After centuries of ignorant and dull compliance, hundreds of millions of people in Eastern Europe and Asia have opened the books. Old fears no longer frighten them. They are resolved, as they must be, that there is no more place for imperialism within their own society than in the society of nations. I like that. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, okay, if you ask, like, how is this going to happen? It's all well and good that you have these beautiful visions for win-win, you know, development around the world. But, I mean, is it realistic? Is it practicable? Um, how were these guys actually thinking about making it happen? Now, I want you all think, to think about what, what Putin and Xi Jinping have created with this new Silk Road BRICS alliance. Okay? Because uh, obviously you need strong nation-state powers that are in a common understanding of the problem and the solutions. And what Putin is calling for the West and for America to recover in itself, that it's lost. Um, Henry Wallace, uh, in 1944, wrote a, a book called Our Job in the Pacific, where he writes, it is, it is vital to the United States, it is vital to China, and it is vital to Russia that there be peaceful and friendly relations between China and Russia, China and America, and Russia and America. China and Russia complement and supplement each other on the continent of Asia, and the two together complement and supplement America's position in the Pacific. Nowhere in here does Britain come up. Oh, here. Now, he knew that Britain had to be taken along, but it was going to be taken along by the collar and not be followed. Okay. 
He expands in another piece, an essay called Two Peoples, One Friendship, in the Survey Magazine of 1944, I think it's November, uh, where he writes, Of all nations, Russia has the most powerful combination of a rapidly increasing population, great natural resources, and immediate expansion in technological skills. Siberia and China will furnish the greatest frontier of tomorrow. When Molotov, that's Russian's, Russia's foreign minister, was in Washington in the spring of 1942, I spoke to him about the combined highway and airway which I hope someday will link Chicago and Moscow via Canada, Alaska, and Siberia. Molotov, after observing that no one nation could do this job by itself, said that he and I would live to see the day of its accomplishment. It would mean much to the peace of the future if there could be some tangible link of this sort between the pioneer spirit of our own West and the frontier spirit of the Russian East. Cool. Yeah. That's good. That's so right there, you have the Bering Strait Rail Tunnel directly being revived after it had not been seen since Tsar Nicholas II had tried to do this in 1906. Um, this is very important. I, I just pulled out a little um, image here. Around this time in the 1940s, um, Roosevelt commissioned and Wallace commissioned the publication of a major stamp featuring Sun Yat-sen and Lincoln uh, with this statement of the people, by the people, for the people, and the, uh, the similar three principles of the people of Sun Yat-sen upon which he understood that China had to eventually organize and evolve itself to set a new type of government into being that had never existed before. And Sun Yat-sen in his writings I find very interesting because he's very clear that we don't want to emulate and become exactly what America is. But he studies Hamilton, he, he talks about the fight between Hamilton and Jefferson and the, the corruption of the slave structures of America. He understands the British corruption of the whole thing. So his writings are very, very useful to read. And he's very clear that we have to take the best of what America is, but then do what, go beyond that, what America didn't even, was not able to fully accomplish in 1787, right? Um, which, unfortunately, didn't get to happen for reasons which some of us have studied, um, but that are completely tragic. Yeah, and it really gets across that China and America, same principles, organization, the Republic of China, and the, that revolution was modeled entirely off of Lincoln, and uh, that's ironically again what China is actually embodying more and more today under Xi Jinping, is this American system principle of. Rail development, protectionism, long-term thinking, win-win cooperation, it's all Lincoln. It's all Roosevelt. It's, it's, it's common, right? So That's a five-year period point to bear. That kind of seems like a, like a cultural exchange or something. That China is very favorable on hmm? all over the place. The, the cultural exchange is kind of what I might be seeing there. Yeah. A five-year period. Maybe. I think there's probably something more direct. And I'm, I'm, let's find out tonight. Uh, yeah, what this we'll is. Uh, yeah. Also, one thing too, Roosevelt assigned Frank Capra, the director, the amazing director, Frank Capra, to do a series of documentaries on why we fight to help educate the American citizenry of what, what this war is really about. And in going through these documentaries, there's about eight or nine of them. One of them is totally on China. And it's just, they're, they're so philosophically anti imperialist, they're really, really moralizing cultural. Uh, educational tools. Really great. It's a great way that art ennobles the people to become wiser people, to become a baby. Which you need to have if you're going to have a democracy. You can't have a bunch of dumbed down people running around Ooh. thinking that they're going to, like, they're shaping their own future. They're not. They're too dumb. You need to have we wisdom. Want as, for yeah, exactly. Yeah, whoever gives you. Yeah, right. That's who you want for. the First Amendment. Freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, again, goes back to your warning at the beginning of your class of James Fenimore Cooper in 1837, who was saying that the, if America is going to be destroyed, it's going to be through the corruption of the people's opinion, right? And through the corruption yes. of presses. That's yes. very good that you started that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, everything was sort of moving with a certain momentum, and America was in the driver's seat. In fact, uh, increasingly, I, I've seen really solid arguments, and I, I have to really study this a bit more, but... Nazism really should have ended about a year before it did. And uh, there's a, a figure named uh, Phil Rubenstein who gave a wonderful class on this, and I, I have to really study it to know it. But he made the point that Churchill and Montgomery, as well as a Canadian, uh, the head of the Canadian Armed Forces, who is, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, McNaughton, 
uh, General McNaughton. Uh, the three of them colluded to not only put thousands of Canadians, in, uh, basically to put them on the front lines unnecessarily to die in uh, machine gun fire in Normandy, that they, or no, in uh, Dieppe, the yeah. battle in Dieppe. But uh, they, they postponed the war. They ensured that no second front would be opened up sufficiently long, um, even though Roosevelt and, and uh, Eisenhower and other generals wanted a second front. Churchill postponed that second front for a very long time to protect the German uh, resistance, in fact, uh, and kept the, the war going for an additional year unnecessarily so that Britain would have time to, to undo the threat of their own non-existence. And I'm going to go through a little bit of that in a second here. Roosevelt gave a sense of that in 1944, um, speaking again to his son, uh, Elliot. He writes a war he, 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 he shares a warning to his son of what he understands is cropping up inside of American uh, intelligence and the State Department. When Roosevelt says to his son, you know, this to Elliot, any number of times the men in the State Department have tried to conceal messages to me, delay them, hold them up somehow, just because some of those career diplomats over there aren't in accord with what they know, I think. They should be working for Winston. As a matter of fact, a lot of them, a lot of the time, they are working for Churchill. Stop to think of them. Any number of them are convinced that the way for America to conduct its foreign policy is to find out what the British are doing and then copy that. I was told six years ago to clean out that State Department. It's like the British Foreign Office. 1944. 1944, wow. exactly. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah, 1944, he was already warning about this. Now, he thought that he had more of, I think, a winning hand than he ultimately did, unfortunately. Um, because what happened, if we look immediately afterwards, by no January 1945, Henry Wallace, his greatest ally, is replaced as vice <coughs> president by a Wall Street stooge, Harry Truman. Harry Truman is complete Anglophile, <laughs> loves Churchill, complete Wall Street, kind of like a prototype of George Bush Jr. today, if you want to get a sense of this personality type. Hmm. Um, so Wallace is out, he's made Commerce Secretary. Now, the, the guy to replace Wal uh, Roosevelt, if anything happens to him, is a Wall Street guy, a British guy. April 12th, Roosevelt dies. Stalin writes to, to Elliot that he believes it was Churchill's men who poisoned him, Unfortunately, we don't have any way of fully knowing what happened because Roosevelt was buried with no autopsy, which is unprecedented for an American president to die while in office with no autopsy. So we don't know. We don't. We have to assume it was natural causes, and, he, and he, maybe he overexhausted himself. I'm personally not persuaded of that. I don't think, and Stalin wasn't either. Um, but then, after Roosevelt dies, we have the unleashing of a series of destructive decisions that change the course of history. August 1945, nuclear bombs were dropped on, dropped on the defeated Japan, two of them, as we know. This is the 75th anniversary of that. And this sets a completely new set of rules into motion defining the post-war paradigm. September 20th, 1945, a few months after that, the OSS, the, the Office of Strategic Services, America's intelligence agency, is disbanded. All patriots, all intelligence officers loyal to Roosevelt and Wallace are dismissed forever. Um, in most cases, uh, very few got any type of positions afterwards. They're all labeled red commie, uh, commie sympathizers. Um, so the purge begins. Cynthia wrote a wonderful article on that called The Enemy Within. Uh, it's on the website on the Canadian Patriot on Strategic Culture. Really good article to read. And then by March 5th, 1946, the Iron Curtain speech is delivered by Winston Churchill in Missouri. Winston Churchill comes to Missouri, delivers the speech that ushered in the Cold War and define a new set of polarized uh, systems of relationships around the world. You know, who so the Soviet Union would control, who the Western capitalist world would control, and the last 70 years has been really defined by this bipolarity, right? Of thinking, oh, are you a communist or are you a capitalist? Mm -hmm. Right, you worship money or you worship the state? False. False discussion. This Which unnatural was, um, imposition, because Russia and the U.S. had been natural friends, including up to the World War II. Yes. And then all of a sudden, it was unnaturally imposed by Churchill that they were all, all of a sudden enemies. That's right. That's right. And, and Roosevelt was even asked 
when, to, when asked to define what he was, how he defines and categorizes his own political philosophy or economy, he, he was asked by a journalist, I was reading this last night, a hothead journalist trying to get him in a corner saying, so are you a capitalist? And he's like, nope. He's like, okay, are you a communist? That's what you must be. He's like, nope. <laughs> and he's like, well, what are you? <laughs> he's like, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm a Democrat. And uh, everything I do flows from my actions, so you can judge me according to my actions. But he didn't allow himself to be boxed into one of these pre-programmed definitions. That was really key. And it's all about your actions that determine who you are. Um, so it's th like today when you when people ask, "Oh, China's communist, Russia's communist, America's capital." It's like, well, you know, China also has the biggest private uh, enterprises uh, going on in the world as well. Yes, they have state. Uh, the, the nation state is it plays a big role in the economy, but so do private enterprises. How are you going to balance that? In the communist system, it's one or the other. Uh, in the capitalist system, so you can see you call them a capitalist. But, you know, it, 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 same thing for Roosevelt. He had a lot of state control, the, the Constitution defined things, but at the same time, you had a lot of private enterprise blossom under Roosevelt, right? So the, sta the state is kind of like a catalyzer to commit a project that ensures a stability and a guarantee that your investments are going to be worth investing in a, a, a long term infrastructure project. It might take 10, 20 years to build. You need some guarantees, right? So the purpose of the state is to get that ball rolling, but then the, you have to allow the freedom of the private sector to get the job done, give out contracts, bid for them, you know, do the work. Yeah. Uh, but that's what Wallace, so Wallace is now, Henry, he's now a uh, Commerce Secretary, he's been downgraded, but he's still an active part of government. He's in the cabinet. But he warns in 1946, while he's still Commerce Secretary, that fascism in the post-war inevitably will push steadily for Anglo-Saxon imperialism and eventually for war with Russia. Already American fascists are talking and writing about this conflict and using it as an excuse for their internal hatreds and intolerances towards certain cr races, creeds, and classes. Oh my god. Yeah. Very strong, very strong speech. And the whole speech is just this good. Um, really worth, worth reading that. Um, he's obviously also pointing out that these same people like the American Liberty League that America, that Roosevelt fought against for the entire 15, 14 years he was in office, uh, which was the Wall Street American Liberty League think tank that was fu that funded the coup d'état to overthrow Roosevelt and put a fascist dictator in power in America in 1934. Uh, uh, this is the same thing that funded Hitler and, and uh, Mussolini. They were the ones who took power again with Churchill and uh, Truman after Roosevelt died. And he's warning that these guys were also breeding and, and sponsoring racist, regressive policies in the formerly slave South, right? That Lincoln fought to liberate. Oh, what was, what was Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. Oh, fighting against? Yeah. He's fighting against something that should have already gone extinct yeah. 100 years before that. Yes. How did that power, how did that racist power structure form again? Right. Which uh, we will have a class on in three weeks time. Three weeks time. Um, yeah, so he's really understanding very clearly what this deep state, road scholar, racist, agrarian, I mean, just machine is that's infesting and taking over. Um, and in another quote that comes from uh, the Soviet Mission Asia in 1946, writes, Before the blood of our boys is scarcely dry on the field of battle, these enemies of peace tried to lay the foundation for World War III. I'm sorry, this is a 1944 speech, by the way, not 1946. So this is while he was still vice president, he was writing this. So uh, these enemies of peace tried to lay the foundation for World War III. He's not talking about Nazism here. These people must not succeed in their foul enterprise. We must offset their poison by following the policies of Roosevelt and cultivating the friendship of Russia in peace as well as in war. 1944. Yeah. And, and he is organizing like nobody's business. Um, it's a dense period of potential, just like 1865, 66, 67, dense potential, um, same type of thing. And just like we saw in Christine's list of assassinations and, and coup d'etats and revolutions and overthrows in, in the 19th century, similar things happen and the, and the chessboard is overthrown. So what happens by September 20th, 1946, Wallace is fired for being a Russian stooge uh, by, by Truman. Um, he's kicked out of government. By March 12, 1947, the Truman Doctrine is announced. The Truman Doctrine just basically being that new American foreign, foreign policy will now be completely defined around stopping the Soviet expansion. And that got America uh, pulled right into civil wars in Greece, in Turkey, 
and it got the ball rolling for regime changes in Iran and in other countries, Nicaragua. Um, keep in mind, the OSS has already been disbanded, right? What happens now? September 18th, 1947, the Central Intelligence Agency is created. Again, in And the National Security Council on the same day. And on the same day, the thing that runs the CIA is the National the NIE, and that's also created the same day. Um, and now you have a completely new set of rules. Uh, Harry Dexter White dies. So August 16th, 1948, IMF is completely hijacked. This is the, the last, the first and last patriot anti-imperialist to ever officially run the IMF. What now dies mysteriously on his way out of a McCarthy, not McCarthy, because McCarthy came later. But there's a House Un Un American Activities Committee hearing on Soviets in America. He's obviously labeled the Red Commie because he's for friendship with Russia and China and development. So everybody like that is labeled Red Commie. And he faces hours of, of, of being under the grill in public. Is uh, On his way leaving the court, he uh, heals over in a heart attack and dies. Um, he was also campaigning for um, Wallace. So in 1948, Henry Wallace didn't disappear. I'm going to say something about that in a sec. But just one other element to this process, uh, Cynthia dug up something very interesting in her paper. Uh, in 1950, there was NSC, National Security Council Memorandum 75, a directive to save the British Empire by the State Department and CIA. <laughs> Basically, with the logic that because the biggest bad enemy of the world is the Soviet Union, any, and the, the British Empire supposedly trying to uh, dissolve itself, um, if it does so, the Soviets could likely take control of all the British uh, former colonies, and we can't allow that. It's more cost-effective, as you point out, to protect the British possessions, oh. and hence the Anglo-American special relationship is set up to now have a new Anglo-American empire. So people Australia. call it an American empire, but it's not American, it's a British empire. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mentioned here that Wallace didn't give up without a fight. I mentioned that uh, Dexter White died while campaigning for Wallace for the president in 1948, uh, Wallace decided to run as a third party candidate. So even though he was kicked out of government, he ran as a, a third party for the Progressive Party of America, along with people like uh, Paul Robeson, the singer. Einstein was a big backer of Wallace as well. Um, Dexter Wright was one of his lead organizers. Um, and he fought biblically. You could listen to some of these speeches online. They're really gorgeous. Uh, really, really, really good. And that would have completely turned the Cold it, The Cold War wouldn't have happened if Americans had acted morally and, uh, react and voted for him appropriately instead of just coming to the propaganda, which they knew they had the, the ability to know was not true. As a comparative genocide scholar who's done deep historical research on genocides in Australia, German Southwest Africa, and the United States, I would say there are many different justifications that people can use to justify crime. And one of the elegant things about the UN Genocide Convention is that motive does not figure into the definition. Why is that useful? Because when you think about a homicide, and a genocide is a homicide multiplied many times over. There are many different motivations that a killer can have for taking the life of another human being. In this particular instance, one of the driving factors was a widespread belief in the inevitability of American Indian extermination. The two major lines of this thinking, one was biological, 
that American Indian people were biologically unfit and would be overwhelmed by the new diseases, new technologies, new animals, new plants that they were encountering. And the other was that this was simply divine will. This was providence. We see both of these strains of thought as early as the 1620s um, in the colonial Mid-Atlantic and in the colonial New England region. But in California, there were people who resisted all of these notions. They resisted the morality of the killing. They resisted the necessity of the killing. And so I tried in the book to really highlight them as a counterpoint to this widespread belief. There wasn't much debate about it. That's what's rather extraordinary. There was a widespread consensus among white people such that editorials advocating the total physical extermination of particular tribes or even every Indian person in the entire United States could be freely published with very little repercussions. So, but there are these moments that show us there are people who knew that this was wrong. And my favorite story in this regard is death squads are going through the northern Sacramento Valley where I was born uh, in the 1860s and they are killing every single Indian farm worker and ranch worker and servant that they can find. They come to one farm very near where I was born and they've killed all the men in the barns and in the fields and they come into the house where the women are and the white uh, woman of the house who's pregnant holds up a quilt between her and several um, Yana women and she says if you want to kill them you're going to have to kill me and my unborn baby as well. And the killers leave and her husband and some other ranchers rescued the few surviving people, put them in wagons, and took them as far as they could get their horses to run in one day. And they escaped into the mountains. We don't know what happened to them. But there were people who knew. There were people in the United States Senate who spoke out against what was happening in California. There were congressmen who spoke out against it. But the reality is that there was such a strong anti-Indian coalition by the 1840s and 1850s that you almost didn't have to talk very much uh, to the public about why this was a necessity. <coughs> Indian killing was a fact of life in the American West at this point. And this might have been a particularly powerful efflorescence of those forces, but there wasn't some complex debate. There wasn't a need to indoctrinate the general population in a virulent Indian-hating ideology in order to carry this out. It began before it was even possible to disseminate ideologies because there weren't any newspapers in the places where the killing was happening. 